Welcome to On the Bubble Podcast, episode 36. I'm your host, Sabasa J. Ueda, and with me is my co-host, Yuki Lee Bender. Today we're gonna be talking about play draw. So if you wanna if you win the die roll, if you wanna go first or if you want to go second. I feel like this is one of the biggest mistakes beginners make, or even like pretty experienced players, like people who've been playing for one, even two years, make a dis- make the wrong decision of choosing to go first or second. Not just in draft, but I also see this in CC as well. And I thought we should talk about that. But before we go into that, how was your week, Yuki? Yeah, definitely agree that this is a decision that a lot of people get wrong, but I'm excited to jump into it later. So my week has been pretty good. I've been not playing that much Flesh and Blood. I think I went to an armory and then did a... Um, some people were drafting and then I met up with them afterwards and I played a Bento Box with them, which is a... Um, it's essentially like a two-player cube where you can draft ninja and you can draft either Ira or Akatsu. And there's like different ways you that you can draft it. But um yeah, OK and Y podcast uh designed it and there's info about that on their YouTube channel. We can put the the link in the description. But um if you're interested in that cube experience, it's it's very, very cool. Um I think the cube probably costs like less than a hundred dollars. If you had to buy everything, and a lot of them are just like commons. Wasn't there something like Art of War in there, if I saw correctly? No, there's no Art of War. Oh, is it, oh it's, it's that's all you got was in there? That's like an expensive. Yeah, game. there's there's just a, that's all you got. But it's not that expensive. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I, I just remember seeing some mythics in the cube, and I was uh, I was wondering how much it would end up costing. N- not even more than a hundred. I don't think so. It's definitely pretty cheap. Like it does have some random dynasty majestics, but they're like the tiger cards. <laughs> and I don't think they're especially expensive, last I checked, but well, maybe that's changed. I don't know. Oh, I see, I see. The dynasty cards are honestly, it's not that they're expensive, they're just like sometimes a little bit harder to come by. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Although I wonder if like I feel like the tiger cards were like not that popular. <laughs> like they just didn't really see much play. Or so, any like, play? Yeah, exactly. So like usually they're like way easier. Like people try it at the start and then they're like, yeah, this is not good. But yeah, I don't know. Was just How was amazing. it? Did you did you guys play a couple couple games or just like one draft? Yeah, we did I guess we did three drafts in total. Uh one of them we only played one of the games though. And it's really fun. Uh the gameplay is like very intricate. There's different archetypes. Like you can play like combo katsu, you can play almost like the Ira Ninja Turtle kind of deck where you have like the D Reacts and you can even get like the Zephyr Needle, which is fucking sick. <laughs> like you can just play Zephyr Needle plus a bunch of D Reacts. Holy. And so if you have all the D Reacts, your opponent doesn't have D Reacts to break your Zephyr Needle. So like <laughs> Oh, that's sick. That's actually yeah. so sick. <laughs> and because you're drafting from a shared pool, you can also like you can also like hate draft quite a bit. Mm, that's actually interesting. Yeah, so there's like a lot of strategy of like you want to draft what's good for your deck, but you also don't want your opponent's deck to get too out of control. And like one of the archetypes in it is the uh, tiger combo, and it's actually sick. Like if you get all the pieces, it's it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's like really really gross like you just play katsu and like because their deck is not that fast you just kind of get to play mid-range and then you just suddenly go off and you're just like i don't know like you play an ant like i forget what they're even called so like mind state of the tiger and predatory streak you have like four of these um crouching tigers and then you get to go like tutor for your tiger swipe they have to block your tiger swipe otherwise you get four more of them and then you also like salt the wounds them for a million um oh and you can have like stubby hammers too like it's just really out of control (laughs) oh you can have stubby hammers yeah yeah if you get all the pieces for that deck it's like actually disgusting because you get to just tutor the tiger swipe every time and then sometimes you also just have like a salt it's it's not that hard to get like five crunching tigers and have them all come in for two go again plus like the four go again that they have to block plus like the salt for 10 or something <laughs> it's just like is a mask of pouncing links in here gross. no there's no mask of pouncing links but there's oh. a um there's mask of many faces as a token 
Oh, as a token. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is it is all the equipment tokens in that set? Um, no. I think it's only Mask of Many Faces and Kodachi's are equipment, and then or are tokens. Sorry, and then the rest is um, the rest of the equipment is all stuff that you have to draft. So you can draft like there's not that many. It's like Quelling Slippers, which is actually very good against the Kodachis and the Breakpoints. Um, you could get like Tide Flippers. Tide Flippers is just like a bad Snapdragons. <laughs> um, yeah, Vest of the First Fist. I forget what else. Okay, so there are some in the in breaking scales, Zephyr Needle. Yeah, there's some, but they're like not. They're like decent, but they're not like super powerful either. I'd say that like overall, the power level of the set is not like super super high. Mm. So you got to play some mid range stuff and not get blown out. Yeah, yeah, you got to play some mid range. You got to play some DRX. Like it really kind of the pl- the play is a lot like the old Ira blitz when ira was like a little more defensive leaning and you had these really grindy ira mirrors um it's kind of like that except there's like multiple strategies within that including that actual ira strategy but it all kind of feels balanced enough i guess okay that's pretty cool it's pretty difficult to design a nice cube and sounds like they did a pretty good job at it yeah it's um it's really a lot of fun and yeah, the, the whole like hate drafting thing is like really interesting because you also get these games where like we cooperate and we both let each other like get most of the pieces is often the way that it works out. Yeah. Or like, or like you have a lower power game where you're both like kind of hate drafting each other. And so you have these decks that are just like super mid rangey. Yeah, like the pile decks, right? <laughs> yeah, but like the piles are like pretty good. Like they're they're good piles. They're just not like, they're not blitz stacks, but they're good piles. Yeah, I guess it's, it's self-regulating because it is 1v1 draft. And, and there's like kind of limited, like there's power cards, but it's also kind of limited. It's like not all like the highest power level. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. I think they really balanced it well. And it's cool that you get to play like the tiger combo. That's just not good anywhere. But then it's like both very fun. And I think because it is lower power level, like being able to do something that broken is like, just a nice contrast. I don't know. Like, it does feel very cube-like where you can play these, like... You know how, like, Magic Cube, you can play these strategies that, like, aren't necessarily strategies anywhere else, but they're really sweet in cube? Yeah, I get you, I get you. It's like, the reason to be playing that cube is, like, I want to do this. And then you, yeah. when you pull it off, it feels real fun and real good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, And at least it gives a home to, to some of these cards that really don't see any play anywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, let's move on. Oh, one thing I want to just talk about myself uh, before we move on. I just had my first 03 draft in Outsiders in like in a quite a bit of a while. I got destroyed at yesterday's draft. Oh, no. And it wasn't and it just like it felt real bad. But like it also felt pretty good because like Ross was apparently listening to our pod and <laughs> And he's just like, oh, I'm supposed to board up against Riptide. So he added like a bunch of random cards into his deck. And then he basically fatigued me. He had like three, maybe four or three cards left in his deck. And that's how many cards he added. Oh, that's so, so sick. What was he playing? He was playing, um, was it Benji or Katsu? He was playing a ninja. Mm, okay, okay. And then uh, he ended up kodachi me out of the game. But like the game was super <laughs> close. And... He's just like, oh, thanks. Uh, I listened to your podcast and uh, heard uh, you need to board up against uh, Riptide. And he did. And I lost. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, that's pretty entertaining. Yeah. I guess the podcast is putting in work, um, just not to Jay's benefit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it sucks too, because it's like the one time I'm like actually grinding for XP so I don't have to top four in RTN to make nationals. And then it's just like, oh, three. Wait, I don't get any XP? What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now Eric I gotta told do- me, Eric told me that you went oh, three, but I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Like, I, I didn't know why. <laughs> He didn't yeah, say anything no. about it. He's just like, oh, it was really bad. I was like, and he's like, I'll let Jay tell you. I was like, oh, okay. 
Yeah, it was uh honestly all the games they were so close. Like I made a misplay against Azalea uh on my first round. I there was a spot where I could uh, I attack with a Widowmaker. Sorry. I have a Widowmaker and Arsenal and two cards in hand. One is a tra- one is a red trap and one is destructive deliberation. And my opponent has three cards in hand, no arsenal. As and he's Azalea. I end up pitching the trap to attack with Widowmaker because he didn't have any equipment. And so if you wanted to block Widowmaker, he needs to give me two cards and then Azalea is going to arsenal and pass is what I thought. And mm-hmm. I didn't think he would just take seven. What ended up happening was they pitched the uh, the trap, attack for uh, seven with Red Widowmaker, and he just goes, okay, take seven. And then I had to, I ended up uh, arsenaling the Destructive Deliberation, and then he came in for like 10 Dominate. And I just lost. If I just had a trap, i get to block three more points, and then the game basically ended. I would have had, I needed three more life to win, essentially. Yeah, that's rough. So you thought your deck was pretty good, it just... You didn't get there? Oh, I thought my deck was pretty insane. Like, I, I basically had, like, a version of Riptide where I had, like, seven traps and 36 cards without playing any bad cards. Yeah, it's like, it didn't help that I lost the die roll against the, the ninja, and then and then he decked mm-hmm. me out because he boarded up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then against um against Eric in the last round from, from uh, Spark of Genius, he... What did he do? What was he playing? He was also playing Ninja. And then I I guess I ended up losing... And it was a pretty tight game as well, but I, I also ended up losing. I don't remember that one in particular. I think I think I lost the die roll. Yeah, I lost the die roll on that one too, and then Eric just beat me. And I was like, okay, this is my o- this is my 0-3 draft day. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone has bad drafts sometimes. Yeah, just how it goes. Yeah, yeah, it's it's honestly it's pretty fun. It's pretty good. Like uh, our our draft community here is getting quite tough, and it gets tougher every week. And it's actually pretty makes it it makes it that much more fun too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's like you you lose you lose. You're like oh one, and you're just like man, the person I'm playing is still like really good, and just like maybe like top eight nationals or like just like recently top 32 the calling is just like you know like you're playing against very very good players that have had good results and sometimes it's even when you're like losing <laughs> so it's pretty strong i went oh two and i'm still playing against eric from spark a genius you know <laughs> <laughs> no free games no free games <laughs> uh let's move on to our main topic so today we just wanted to talk about play draw or when you win the die roll, are you supposed to go first? Or are you supposed to go second? I just wanted to discuss about that. And I guess, where should we start? I guess a best easy question would be, what do you think the default option should be choosing to go first or second if you win the die roll in this game? I think by default, if you are not sure, you should be going second. I think it is especially true in Limited, where the games are really fast. But even in Classic Constructed, I think most decks want to go second so that you are the first one getting like the meaningful attack. Um, and I think this even applies to like a lot of decks that people don't think it applies to. Like Azalea, for example, actually just wants to go second. Like she's much happier going second like yeah you can dominate red in the ledger them turn zero but like when you don't do it you're just so disadvantaged that like why didn't you just go second because if you're time walking them anyways who cares like it doesn't matter so yeah it's like i think in most cases like these decks just want to go second and unless you have a very good reason to go first like a very strong reason you should be going second yeah, I think I agree with that. Like going second in this game is just so much better compared to like other games like Magic the Gathering where you just want to play the first card, like you just want to be the one to cast your first spell, play your first land. In this game because you draw up to 4 cards every turn and then you end up playing like every card. Just like the advantage of you going second and drawing four more cards is just worth so much more that I think it's 
I think it if that flips the the power dy- dynamic enough that you want to just go second in this game. Yeah, it's it's kind of like if you think about the math on it, it's kind of like you you draw like three extra cards almost. Um cuz like yeah, your opponent like you get to draw like three more cards than your opponent almost because they get like they get to go first and they get their arsenal but then like you get like a whole extra turn so that like one card that they get is like you know like you like you're you're getting like a full hand minus that one card that they get which is like very very strong yeah and if you think of it in a way of like let's say your opponent doesn't even attack you and they just go to arsenal and draw one you basically stranded three cards in their hand so exactly. that's plus yeah. three I think that would be like the easiest and the cleanest way you can think about that. Obviously, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, you can we can see this in CC, and we also actually see this in Draft a bunch, where there is a there is a a lot of different spots where you actually do want to go first in in depending on the matchup and depending on your deck as well. And I think this might be the reason why people get tripped up, not just because like they might be used to going first from other TCGs. It also is like there are actually some matchups where you want to go first and then they feel like it's very strong to do so. And when they have that experience, it's like, what is it called? Not positive reinforcement. I guess it is like positive reinforcement, mm-hmm. but like not in the right way. Um, it's like they're you're enforcing. Sorry, you're having like a positive inform- enforce- enforcement. Sorry, positive reinforcement on a decision that you made wrong, essentially. And. This comes up, I guess we can talk about Outsiders Draft a little bit. I think initially when the format came out, people thought Benji should go first. I'm not too good at explaining this. Do you want to try and explain why people thought Benji wanted to go first? Yeah, I think we even said this on the podcast. It's just like being able to deal unblockable damage and then still get your arsenal feels really good on paper. Like, you're just like, yeah, like, you know, I, maybe I leak like four damage or something and then I get an arsenal. Like, that seems pretty decent value. The problem is, like, you often don't get to do that. Sometimes you just allow them to use, like, their Seekers equipment to get value that they might not have been able to otherwise because you're pretty aggressive. Turns out, like, especially because you have 17 life, just them hitting you first is really bad. Like... I had a Riptide do something like um, Rabble, Lace, uh, Lace with Blood Rot, attack you with a Withering Shot. And I'm just like, wow, you had like a 13 damage turn. And like, if I don't block the nine, I just <laughs> take a Frailty and a Blood Rot. Like, it's just, and you just lose. Like, you just instantly lose. All of your cards block for two as well, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and because you have 17 life, you're just like, okay. So am I taking like 14 from this turn or something or like 13 from this turn and going to like, you take 13, you go to four. It's like, really? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. I guess. And also it's like, there's this idea that Blitz Benji actually always wants to go first because in Blitz, Benji gets to be like eight unblockable on turn one. And then we'll, on the second turn, we'll just like not block you and then just deploy their whole hand on the next turn and do like 20 damage or something like that. And it's like main, mostly all unblockable as well. Mm-hmm. And it's also because they they have power cards like the Majestics from like Spring Tidings like that, uh, that make it that make their turn bigger and longer and just more powerful. But that's just not the case in this format. Uh, or not even in, in any draft format where they have to still play generics that can be blocked. They still have to play cards that like block for two that they don't always want to attack with or a little bit more awkward to attack with and ends up being like, you can't be as unfair as in Blitz with Benji in draft. So what ends up happening is when you use that information from before where you're like, oh, Benji wants to go first in Blitz, so he wants to go first in Draft. It just doesn't apply here. And I guess like a best like example would be in Magic, something like Manalus, Dredge, and Legacy wants always wants to go second. 
But if you play some kind of dredge strategy in limited, you still always want to go first because you still have to play lands. Yeah, I think like I'm interested because you said there's like a lot of examples in draft and I'm trying to think of where those examples are and I'm actually not sure. Um, like another example that comes to mind is in Uprising, we had Icelander. Going first with Icelander seemed like obviously like that's super good because I get to just hit you with arcane damage and then like leak some damage and get an arsenal. Same idea as Benji actually. And same thing of uh, same th- same thing of having low life, and they're like, oh, because I'm Icelander and I have a card in Arsenal, like I get to disrupt them on their first turn, and it's like that is true, but also they can just Helios Miter all your damage, so like you often don't actually leak very much, and then you just get an Arsenal, and they just kind of get value out of their Helios Miter, and it turns out that just like putting the pressure on them when they don't have a free redraw is just way better because you still you still get the card in Arsenal to disrupt them on their first meaningful turn. So like, you know, like, yeah, they have a five card hand, but like you get to hit them and then still have an Arsenal. And that, that's just better. Yeah, yeah, that is true. That is true. I, I, I was more thinking of like, I think in Outsiders, um, as Riptide, I typically want to go first, um, depending mm, on how much go true. again I have. Uh, and another format would be like Arcane Rising. If I'm Kano, I actually like sometimes prefer to go first, if depending on how my deck uh, is constructed, and if I can like activate Kano or just like set up my arsenal with Kano, it just feels a lot better going first. That's Kano has the same same problem as like you still also want to go second because you don't really want to get attacked on like them mm-hmm. going second. But obviously, it is deck dependent and also format dependent matchup dependent as well but there are just like obvious obvious spots where like azalea sometimes just wants to go first in draft like in cc i think you want to go second but in draft if you go first and just put a lace and dominate like you you can't lose after that Mm -hmm. yeah for sure so it really depends on like how much power you have going first in, in draft right like how mm-hmm. much power can you generate going first and like how unfair can you be to your opponent would be it would be like the metric to decide if you want to, if you if you can go first i guess that would be that would be the right question to ask yourself is can i go first or do i want to go first would probably be the question you should be asking yourself yeah Let's talk about CC for a little bit. In CC, obviously, we already said that we do want to go second in that format. What are like maybe like main examples of like when you don't want to go first, or sorry, when you don't want to go second? Sorry. It it's sort of funny because I feel like a lot of the decks that wanted to go first are banned now, or like they're living legend now, or have or have received bans, um, which is interesting. Anyways, there's like Prism. Aura Prism really wants to go first because because they have to always control your auras and you kind of force them, like if you get to play an aura, you force them to respond to you and you force them to like start dealing with your auras right away. And in a lot of, in a decent number of your games, you just drew two auras that you could play and you could double aura turn zero. And then they're just behind on auras for the rest of the game and you didn't have to take any damage to set that up. Um, and you also just kind of get like more looks at things. You can potentially like play an aura, arsenal, an aura that you couldn't cast, and then like have a chance to draw into double aura, and then you're just rolling. So just going first and getting to like set up those permanents on board was like sometimes you just win the game. Yeah, sometimes you it just feels like you're just so far ahead. Like you don't actually win, but you're just like super favored after that happens. Small, super small story time about that. I'm playing at a battle hardened top eight. I this is Prism Starvo meta, and I'm playing against Prism and I'm Starvo. I'm fatigue Starvo. Um, just a little bit more. Um, what's it called? Context, just because. Uh, fatigue, fatigue Starvo is just a pile of Oldham cards that, and then I'm just playing the Starvo hero, <laughs> and my Prism opponent in top eight just goes, oh, "I have the worst luck today. I've never had double aura." And then he goes first and just goes, oh, double aura, go. And then I just lost the game. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, double aura is not fair. That 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 really needed to get banned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the double aura was 
really, really strong. Most decks just can't ever catch up. <laughs> yeah, it's like the one moment I'm just like, why am I not chained today? <laughs> and and like that's the funny thing too, right? Like, so like chain. There's another deck that often likes going first, but like, why did he like going first? Well, because you get your shackles rolling and getting your shackles earlier is really, really good. You get to filter your hand. So you get quite a bit of hand sculpting as well with Grasp of the Arc Knight. And you also get to Arsenal. And like often Chain's four card hands at the very start of the game are just not that great. Like like Chain's cards are like fine, but he's a good deck because he gets to play so many of them. Chain's cards are not fine. They're bad. You just get you just get like seven more cards and then it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> like there's like some cards that are decent, but like yeah, most of them are pretty terrible. Um like ghostly touch, like ghostly touch is not a card like it's a four for one. That's it's like the bad critical strike, right? But the thing is that you get it as a free card like a good chunk of the time. I was gonna say look, look at a card that got banned when chain was a thing. It was Seeds of Agony. And that card is like it is one of the worst rate on cards you can get it is a you play the card it has go again but it does one damage and that card was too powerful yeah just because it was free yes yeah but again like i i think the like kind of common theme is you get to you get to set up a bunch and you're setting up some number of permanents with rune chance and your soul shackle which gives you like a continuing value throughout the game it's again like you have like a very strong reason to set up, and even then, it's not like it's not like Chain hated going second. It was still good to go second, uh, just yeah. not as good as going first. Yeah, I think all of these heroes that did end up LLing, they 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 were just like powerful going going first, like all the time. They just like always had something to do on turn one, and they were also powerful going second, and which is probably the reason why they ended up living legend so quickly is because of how powerful or how much like they just didn't care if they lost the die roll um and like didn't go first or second yeah like if your opponent's default is i want to go second and you're so powerful that like they need to go first just to deny you going first like it's that's a very powerful dynamic (laughs) yeah very powerful dynamic and like the other example of this is just uh, Viscerai. So Viscerai is still legal, but when you could play Skeleta Viscerai, specifically, when you were the aggro deck, you often wanted to go second. But when you were when you were like the setup combo deck, like sometimes you just go first and you make like eight rune chants, and like you're you're always like kind of gated on rune chants because a lot of it takes action points and like you can only make so many on a turn but just getting to do that for free at the start of the game is just really strong like you just want to get to your big rune chant count and combo as fast as you can and just getting to start that right away is really really good but again it's like you're getting like if you make like eight rune chances like oh i just got like eight damage and eight resources on the board or slash like four cards i guess practically or no two cards off sonata so you're just like oh i draw two cards and eight damage later in the game it's like very very insane yeah that that honestly still doesn't sound fair i guess that's why it's still banned yeah exactly so so chain so so viscera is not living legend but it's only because they banned his armor that was making him super super broken like like he for sure would be ll by now if if they hadn't banned skeleta it's so funny because that's the deck I played in Ultimate Pit Fight is like the the Viscerai make infinite rune chant, try and kill all three or four other players on the same turn, Viscerai. Yeah. You can like that just means that Viscerai can do like sixty damage on one turn if he really wanted to. Obviously it, it has to be in the Ultimate Pit Fight like context of like everyone has to be playing the commander like i'm not gonna attack you and then you gotta set up more and stuff like that but like once you get to do that like you just gotta do 60 damage in one turn it's like gross yeah yeah um it's like how viscera i could just like otk oldham like sometimes even oldham's like gain life like i remember that was like the australia nationals finals there's like an oldham whose strategy is just i'm not gonna hit you i'm just gonna sit here and gain life and then 
like I won't hit you so you can't filter as quickly. And then Hayden, Hayden Dale was just like, yeah, I'm just going to keep like trying to filter my hand as I can and make rune chance and then just like pop off and kill you even though you're at 50 or something. And I'm going to go through all your, all your hand, your armor, everything. You're just dead. That's <laughs> <laughs> so gross. Or, or, or you're at like, you're at like three and then like they kill you with Rosetta Thorn over the next couple of turns, like pretty easily. Man, I, I somewhat miss all of these like living legended heroes, essentially, where they were so powerful. And I guess like, obviously as the format changes, the decks have become powerful change, but Man, when Chain was at full power, that deck felt so unfair. Or like when Starville was at full power, that deck felt so unfair. <laughs> I'll say with the Viscera. It's just like, man, yeah. I, I kind of miss sometimes playing those like insanely unfair decks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, on the topic of that, though, they did announce something about Living Legend format. From what I've heard, they're going to announce it once there's going to be four LL heroes. So it's going to be pretty close. I think Briar is at like 950 points and Olam is reaching up to the 900 points as well. So they're going to be pretty close to hitting LL. So we're going to end up getting an LL format probably by the end of this year i would assume maybe not because if lexi starts no, to get better there, there's no way i think between rtn and nationals oldham and briar will receive enough points i I, th- I think that they're strong enough decks that they're gonna i think they're gonna take some events down mm-hmm. maybe not briar like maybe briar gets stuck but she's so close too she doesn't need that many wins i'm checking right now she needs 36 more points yeah, so it's that's just so uh, little. 18, that's 18 road to nationals. But if she like wins like one nationals and you know, like it's like then it's yeah. just like so much easier. She has like one, 20 from that. Uh one nat is either 10 or 20 points. So yeah, like I think it's 20. Uh it depends on how many players are in it. Oh, does it? Yeah. So oh, it okay. says national champions with players with less than 96 gets 10 points, and national champions with players with more than 96 gets 20 points. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So even if, like, uh, if Briar wins a 50 player nationals, it'll, it'll only get 10 points. But, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited to be able to play some legend, living legend heroes, mostly like Star of the Show. It's probably one of my favorite decks, and not even. I didn't really like the um the one that played a lot of elements. I just like I just liked fatiguing people with Bravo, and uh, yeah, I just don't I just don't like Oldham's ability. I don't think it's like that powerful. But like Bravo Star of the Show's ability was like hyper powerful, so like it felt really good. And you mm. still got to fatigue people. Yeah, I just yeah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Starvo was definitely a very good deck that you could build in a lot of ways. We don't have pulse of ice. Oh no no LL, LL format. Everything is unbanned. I forgot. Okay, yeah. That, that, that's what I was. That's what I was hoping as well. Like like, what if you can just play like Skeleta Viscerai there too, and then like full power prism and full power chain. Like <laughs> the format sounds nuts. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you can play any of the heroes that aren't legend. Maybe you can. I'm not sure. I f- I feel like yeah. I feel like you should be able to, just because like. Why not? That's true. Like, there's so many banned cards. Like, you can drone people in that format. Yeah, but also just, like, if people want to play their Reinar deck in the Living Legend format, like, why not let them do that? You know what I mean? Like, they're, like there's just no cost. <laughs> That's true. That is true. And you just make for a more diverse format. Like, what if a new hero comes out and they're super sick? And then you're just like, yeah, this thing is, you know, like, now really good in the living legend format which is probably means it's a really broken deck but but you know like it could happen and and i think like there's just no reason just having more decks just seems like a like a better thing and you let more people play the format if they want to so i don't know okay we we came we went off on a tangent a little bit uh but uh, was there anything else yes. you want to talk about going first or second yeah i i think it would be I think for a lot of people, you might almost be better off just always going second because the number of times that you should be going first is so small. Um, so if you're like not that confident, you should just default to going second. Um, and then I th- also think that like really make sure that you want to go first um, and the incentives need to be really, really 
big for that to actually be the case. Like, yeah, you need to be getting like multiple cards out of value very consistently, which usually just means constructed and, and only very few decks. Most decks just want to go second. I guess we should talk about this a little bit more in depth. Like, in in exactly in draft, what would be the reasons to go first? Just for like the more advanced players, like what would you give them an advice to like look for when choosing to go first? You need to be getting a lot of value out of your turn to really justify going first. Um, I think you need to be leaking like probably like five damage or more. Do you think it's like five damage plus an arsenal, or do you think? It's yeah, like- I think it's like five damage plus an arsenal, and then you're pretty happy. Like then, then like that was then it was definitely worth it to go. It was go definitely for. worth it, and four is like pretty decent, but less than that is not good enough. Do you think the game's pretty fair if it does like three damage in an arsenal? I think at that point you're, you're probably like Ye- yeah, you did good enough. I think you did good enough, but you'd probably still would have rather have gone second. That's fair, that's fair. And then I guess if you're only being able to like leak two damage, that's probably when you're going to start having some problems. Or if you do like less than one and only get an arsenal without any permanence, then then you, you feel it feels like you got punished for going first. Yeah, you're just you're just kind of starting the game from behind. And that doesn't mean that you can't win. Like sometimes you can still win those games. Maybe your opponent stumbles or maybe you just have like a very good sequence of cards or you, whatever. But it's just harder. And this is way more prevalent and like easier to understand if you're just playing like two aggro decks and the decks just like don't block and they won't be able to like get a pivot turn essentially of like blocking out and then like waiting for your opponent to brick one turn or something like that. Aggro mirrors end up being like, I'm going to play my whole hand. They play their whole hand. You play your whole hand. And when you keep on doing that, it gets pretty clear that when you go second, your win percentage goes up like a significant amount. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay. Um, I think one other thing I just wanted to talk about briefly about uh, an, an advantage about going first would be if, your life total doesn't matter then going first might be a good option what i mean by this is if you're fully committed to fatiguing your opponent from turn zero then i think going first is better as obviously it depends on if you have weapons or not with go again but if you have weapons with go again that means like kodachis for example if you swing both the kodachis um and your opponent ends up blocking with two cards in hand, you're actually up two cards on the game, and then that might just be a... If you consider each card to be about, like, worth two or maybe even three life, that's, like, exactly what um, Yuki was saying. Like, if you got five damage in, you end up winning the game, and that's about how much damage that Kodachi did if the actual life total doesn't matter, and if cards in deck is the most important thing in that matchup... That- in that case, you should probably go first. But most games of Flesh and Blood don't come down to it. And even if you can correctly correctly figure out that that is the right thing to do, it still might not be right for you. Because it is when you are trying to deck people out, it also asks you to play perfect. And... If you make like three mistakes during the game, that could just like end you end up you, that could make you end up losing the game because you actually got zero points of physical damage in on the first turn of the game. Mm-hmm. It's really awkward in like in classic constructed as well, where if you're already just like know you want to fatigue your opponent, going first can be pretty sick too. Cause you still same thing, you get like you get to rip a couple cards out of their deck. And that might be the difference at the end of the game. You'll be at like one life, but your opponent will have no cards in the deck. I think it kind of depends on the dynamic too. Like the more disruption you have, the more you probably just want to go second anyways, just so you can disrupt them right away when they don't have the free redraw. But the more that you're just like purely fatiguing, the more that I think going first gets gets quite better, quite a bit better. And it's just like, you also need to, if you are doing the, if you are going first to fatigue your opponent, you also do need to overcome that your your hands have to be, they have to block significantly better than the attack, essentially. And like, you have to be okay blocking every single turn and still be able to rip cards from your opponent while you block. And 
almost all or most decks can't do that. So it's going to be at a very specific spot. And honestly, you will know when you want to do this. Yeah, exactly. Um. Okay, so anything else you want to say for for play draw or anything in general before we end up the episode close up the episode i guess our tns are coming up next week maybe next week we should talk about should we do like we like go through a draft go through draft footage Ooh, go through draft footage for our episode of the podcast yeah just to like help people get ready for our tns uh, since I know some people's drafts are RTNs, I, like we, we could talk about CC as well. But I, I think I kind of feel like off the back of the Pro Tour, there's like a pretty clear picture of the metagame and what it looks like right now. And we're going to have to see how that shifts and evolves. But I, I don't think it shifts that much. Like I think Lexi is still like, extremely good. Oldham is also still like very, very solid. And Andromai is like good due to her positive matchups into Ranger. Um, and, and like having a decent olden matchup, depending depending how you build it. I don't know. People swear on both sides that they're invincible, and then somebody always loses. So I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess except when they go to time, then then nobody, then they both lose. <laughs> they're they're both invincible, but they they can still get losses. Yes, yes. <laughs> Maybe that's why they think it's uh, they're both invincible because. They can never finish the. They can never get the game to conclusion. So they're just like, I never lose, unless I get go. Unless I go to a time, but then they never actually finish their game. So they never lost, but they get the loss on on their record. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess all that's to say, we'll talk about CC right now. Just play one of those decks, Dromai, Lexi, or Oldham, unless. You have another deck that you think has decent matchups into like at least two of them. I think if you have like good matchups into two of them, like actually good matchups into two of them, your deck is like probably okay as a meta call if you think more of those two will show up. But like if you only have a good matchup into one of them, like if, if you that's the hero you want to play, then then you should go and play it. But I don't think it's the most competitive choice. That's fair. That's fair. If there also is like always in flesh and blood that like deck familiar familiarity where if you aren't familiar with these decks you have to you have to start practicing it now to very soon because rtn season is like two weeks if you don't have the time to put the reps in with dromai or oldham or lexi i don't think you should play these decks you need the reps with these decks to be able to play these decks to the point to be able to win or top four in RTN. Yeah, that, that, that is a good point. I think that while these decks are clearly the strongest decks, I think it's by not as big of a margin as some of the previous formats where just like like Starvo or like Chain was just like so clearly dominant compared to everything else. It's, it's not really like that. Like all the decks are better, but it's not like they, they can still very much lose to... A whole bunch of other decks like briar is kind of okay um dash is kind of okay like there's a lot of heroes who are like kind of okay and you could see them taking down like an event here and there even if they're not quite as good which is kind of cool even like decks like lexi is just like i ended up playing your cc deck in a blitz event basically took out some random cards until it hit 40 and mm -hmm. i was just making misplays left and right and uh, a couple of people was watching my game, and you're like, you miss lethal. And I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, I did miss lethal. And then I bricked myself and like put two arsenal <laughs> cards I couldn't play. Had to unbrick myself by blocking with my new horizons on an attack for one or something like that. So I can just destroy my cards in arsenal so I can unbrick myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, Lexi can be tough sometimes. And uh, you could definitely lose games to yourself. And by the way, I actually ended up winning that game because I unbricked myself with the New Horizons. Um, <laughs> oh but uh, uh, never punished. Yeah, just letting you guys know. it's it, Lexi isn't like, you can't just pick that deck up and play it right away. You probably need like a good week's worth of playtesting or like, you know, at least like maybe like three armories or something like that. So like, you know, some of the matchups and like playing Lexi into Olam is quite difficult as well. You need to know exactly 
you need to have a game plan and you need to play towards your game plan. And if you don't, you could end up getting fatigued. So just uh, be careful on that as well. Yeah, it's a game where you have to make so many decisions and play quite quickly. All of your decisions matter. And I think that if you have a good game plan and you're really confident, you, you're you you're pretty solid into basically all types of Oldhams. But you can still definitely lose if things don't come up the right way. So, yeah. I guess all of that to say is like, I think those are the best decks by a decent amount. You should aim to play something that is at least okay into some of them. Um, and then go with what you know. Um, if you have time to learn these decks, great. If you don't, maybe not. And and I'll say that Dromai might like almost be too late. Um, if you haven't played Dromai, I th- think that learning her in two weeks is pretty hard. Um, I know I felt like that coming into the Pro Tour. Uh, there's a point where I was considering maybe playing Dromai. Um, I test with Ian Zhang, who actually came in ninth on Dromai. Uh, bubbled. He he had the same record. I think he was X three, and he, he just came in ninth, which is too bad. But um, I considered switching to that deck because it seemed pretty good to me. And I just realized there was no way that I could learn it well enough to play on a pro tour level. Yeah, exactly. Like there was just no chance. Cause like Ian was saying, like he was saying like the thing about Dromai is that everything is so specific. Like you need to know like exactly what to do in each of your matchups. And it's like always like a different strategy of like how you pivot and which dragons are important and like how much you should be blocking and, blah blah blah. it's like very very specific and like even into your fringe matchups you need to like know all your plans like that inside and out or you just kind of have a bad time (laughs) yeah droma is one of those decks where you're just i'm just like obviously both myself and yuki we don't play droma every time i look at that deck or pick that deck up and play like a game of cc with it i'm just like i don't get it like what's going on with this deck or like i look at somebody's list and there's like a bunch of cards where just like don't understand why it's in there and it's not something like where you can like pick up a an Oldham deck and just like know which cards should go in and which cards should go out. In like Droma, you're like, what is this card doing in here? Or like, what is wh- how am I supposed to ever play any of my cards with like an only red deck? And like they all play so differently, and you really need to like talk to the person that like actually built the deck to be able to like fully understand what dromai is trying to do if you haven't um like practiced with dromai that much and and all the stuff that we said about the the lexi matchup into oldham dromai is even harder i think the yeah the end games are so tricky there's like a lot of pitch stacking involved because you're pitching rads there's a lot of like you have to adapt to how much they're pressuring you because if they're hitting you that's kind of actually a problem but they can also just pretty easily fatigue you with all all of their poppers if you're not careful and so you're usually like yeah there, there's different schools of thought on it but you're trying to like find some way to like grind them out of poppers or some elaborate plan where you like tumult tie their crown of seeds tumult tie their null rune and hope that they don't have another null rune and then you burn them all a bunch but it's just like like nothing is straightforward. The games are super long and very complicated and all of your decisions matter so much and you can just so easily get punished and lose. So And then talking about that, just like Olam is not a that that is not easy as to play as well. Like you're ending up to playing like twenty plus turns in a lot of your matchups and if you make like one or two wrong decisions of like when to crown, when not to crown, when to arsenal, when not to arsenal, you could fall behind pretty easily and um, obviously you do have like a lot of like good cards in Oldham. Like Oldham probably just has like the highest just like highest general power level per card. Just like just looking at a card, like Spinal Crush is a powerful card, like Endless Winter is a powerful card, Pummel is a powerful card, Command and Conquer is a powerful card. Like they're just all powerful cards in your deck. But like decks that have lots of cohesive game plans can like go come over come over top of you and then you're using your utility cards like Crown of Seeds and Oldham's ability to like really push the edge on your more powerful cards. And obviously Tunic as well. So it's it's also like not a deck where you can like just pick up and play and know what to do against every matchup either. So all of these decks are just like I feel like in Flash and Blade you just need to be like comfortable with whatever deck you choose. 
the more playtesting you do, the better you're going to be doing against the the general population. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I think that being very knowledgeable and sometimes just understanding the matchup, like if you're playing a fringe deck, just understanding the matchup much better than your opponent can make it a good matchup for you. Even though in reality, if they had practiced the matchup, they they you you would not be favored into them if they're playing optimally. But just most of the time, people aren't playing optimally because they just your your hero is obscure enough. And I think that's a reasonable place to be too. And that's kind of what I was getting at at the start, where I think you should play one of these decks or aim to play one that's good into two of them. Um, that's a lot of these like like Briar is really good into Oldham and Dromai, but not into Lexi, in my opinion. Similarly, like. Azuri is really good into Lexi, and because Lexi is the most popular, like maybe you can play Azuri, but then your Droma and Oldham is kind of rough, so it's like a little bit tricky. But there's a lot of these decks where, like, if you wind up in a meta game that's really concentrated on one of the heroes, and you just bring the counter, you could definitely get rewarded. Or you play Dorenthia and just hope none of your opponents have Red Warrior cards in the last year, and then you just get them. Sometimes it's a pretty good strategy. And Dorinthia can be like genuinely scary sometimes when she, if she like, once the snowball starts, it, it yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It, it, it can be hard it to get tip- over there. It typically starts because your opponent didn't know what reactions exist and they end up blocking and you're like, wait, I lost my block card. It went back to my hand and it took five damage and you get two counters. How do I beat this? Yeah, that that, that is usually the case, but like occasionally they just, they just have it. Yeah, you just draw something. the nuts. Like sometimes there's, they just like have the combination of cards where you're just like, I I cannot do anything about this because like, yeah, you just have too many options, um, and I can't keep up with it. Like turn turn one energy potion, and I'm like, no, how do I beat Dory now? <laughs> <laughs> turn one energy potion is very powerful into Oldham as uh, as Dorenthia. Oh, oh, that's so gross. <laughs> Yeah, you're just always representing so many more possibilities for the rest of the game. Two card hand with an energy potion? It can be literally anything. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we talked about CC enough. Let's uh, wrap it up. Yeah, so that's going to wrap it up for this week. As always, thanks for listening. Good luck as you get ready for your RTNs, or maybe good luck at your RTNs, depending when on when you end up listening to this episode. Um seems like an interesting meta and you know it's always cool to have the option to play either cc or draft um so so that's really awesome um so yeah good luck out there and if you have any questions that you want answered on the show um feel free to comment on our most recent youtube video or you can also message us on twitter i am at yukili bender and j is at ueda j uh on twitter um Additionally, you can email us at onthebobble at gmail.com and send us your questions directly there if you like. Um, All of those are, are options that are available to you. Until next time, have a good night. Okay, sign off. Oh, I guess on the sign off, we can just talk about the uh, comment we wanted to talk about. Uh, we just, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, like literally as we were right before we were recording it, I just like saw a notification on a, on a comment and like it made me laugh pretty, it just like made me laugh. It just said, like, yeah, pull it up. Just give me one second. Yeah. It's like on a, one of our earlier episodes, it just says, we said casual players may draft this set five times in an entire month where I still do believe that. But then he comments like, ha, I'm about to head into RTN season with zero outsiders draft experience. With the upside down <laughs> smiley face. <laughs> yeah. It's funny how like sometimes as a very enfranchised player, you can like have a very weird concept of like what is a lot or not. <laughs> yeah. Like- some people just like play and like play like a handful of armories and then go to their RTN and that's like how they interact with the game. And there's a lot of players that are like that, actually. Um, Honestly, that's like the majority of the players, actually. Yeah. And then even even the players who do come out to Armory all the time, like, how many of them actually go to draft Armory once a week? I don't think it's that many. Like, I talk to a lot of people who are like, oh, yeah, draft's not really a thing where I'm from.
It's like, oh. Yeah. I hear that a lot too, where it's like, oh, there's like no drafts at, at my local area. Like you can't, you can't, they don't, like the, the stores don't actually run drafts. It's like well, probably a both a combination of like their, the player base came probably from like either constructed magic or something like Yu-Gi-Oh or other games where draft isn't really prevalent. So limited didn't really like take off. Luckily in Vancouver, um, drafting in magic is like pretty big here. There's like a bunch of drafts like throughout the week. And I feel like obviously I think it also helps that like both myself and you are in Vancouver and we and have... Eric too. Spark of Genius Eric loves limited as well. Yeah, and Eric. And we have like a pretty big influence on like the kind of events that get run here. So like we can ask for draft to happen and then they would host one essentially. Yeah. And I think draft is very much the kind of thing that like I know there are some people that just want to play constructed and don't like draft and like I feel like often don't feel like they get draft and I think that like you'd have the experience that if you if you played it enough and like started to really understand it that it'd probably be more fun than you'd imagine like it's possible that you still prefer constructed but I I think that you would find that draft is actually quite deep and quite interesting. Um, the so, so I think like a lot of the people here end up liking draft is basically what I'm trying to say. Like, I think like we've, because they've played it and been exposed to it so much, they, they have started enjoying it. They've actually found the, the fun in it. Yeah. I think it's like doing one draft on a set, not that fun. Like, I would never want to, like, do the one draft, right, in a format. Like, I, I hated doing that in, like, um, honestly, like, in Magic, there was, like, the master set. And there will be people who say, like, oh, I only do the one draft of that set. Obviously, because it's, like, $50 a draft or something like that, ridiculous. And it's, like, really not affordable, because you can't really always open fifty dollars worth of cards and like resell it or whatever, but that kind of experience to me, I don't think is worth it for doing a draft. Draft is typically a lot more fun when you maybe do like ten, twelve, thirteen of a same format, and you start to like when you start to actually like improve and like. You get like you, once you get a concept of like what cards are good, what cards are bad. Why am I picking this card? Why, when the draft portion starts to matter and like you have meaningful decision points during the draft, that's when draft gets really fun. And to get to that point, four drafts might not be enough. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And especially if you're somebody that doesn't have a ton of experience with draft, like um, it takes everybody some time to learn, but it, it is transferable from set to set. And if you're somebody who is really good at draft, you will tend to be, not to say you're good at every format, people definitely have formats that just don't click with them, but um, or click more than others. Um, but Typically, if you're a strong limited player, it will transfer from set to set. Yes, yes. And obviously, like, just like card evaluation, picking, deck evaluation, like, memorizing what you've already picked in competitive drafts. Like, all of these things are just, like, not easy things to practice unless you get, like, like, how many drafts are you in so far, like, for Outsiders, Yuki? Like, this set's been out for... A month? Is it only been a month? Something like that. Maybe just over, like five weeks or something. It uh, came out on March 24th. So yeah, about five, five, six weeks. Yeah. I don't think I have that many. Like, I, I, I thought I would have more than I did. It's hard for me to count because I did some online and then I did some at Armories and then I did some at, like, the Airbnb. Um... I don't know. I'd guess like 2025, 20, maybe 30, but I kind of doubt it. I think 2025. 20, yeah, like 
I'm I'm on the same boat. I'm I've done like I think I've done a little bit more than you. Maybe I'm in like the 30s now and like the set's been out for 40 days, right? Like <laughs> we're and and I still feel like I'm still learning something every time I draft. And I'm 30 drafts in. Yeah. I think the other thing that makes draft in Flesh and Blood really good is like yeah, the draft portion in Flesh and Blood is probably not as interesting as Magic, like the actual drafting of the cards. But the gameplay is really, really good. And, and in some ways, the gameplay is like, it almost feels like the most, some of the games feel like the most pure Flesh and Blood almost, where like neither deck is really doing anything super broken and you're trading and you're playing like medium-sized hands and it's just like this value grind fest. And because it's, because it's 30 card decks, like fatigue is a thing and you probably get to second cycle a lot. And just like, it just feels like all the fundamental game concepts, like the, like, like all the decks have like their own important stuff, but those like building blocks that are foundational and transferable skills between decks, it feels like all of those are like highlighted in draft. And the only, and that and your like ability to get into a good deck are really like what it's about. Um, it's less about like, I'm fi, I draw my art of war belittle combo. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's <laughs> CC's hard. like CC is still hard and there's a lot of meaningful decisions, but it's sometimes it's more like about the metagame and, and stuff like that than it is about like the fundamentals of Fab. Yeah. Chain mirror. How many art awards did you draw? Three. How many art awards did you draw? Two. Guess who won the game? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, um, I think that should just wrap up the episode. Yeah, bit of a longer one. Um, thanks for listening. Have a good night. Yeah, good night, everyone. <laughs>